Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's coffee session sponsored by the California Department of Education, or CDE. My name is Cyan Bastions, and I work for the training and outreach team at ETS, and I'm here to guide us through our session today. Um, I have colleagues from ETS, the CDE, and some partners that will provide some updates uh, and answer your questions today. So as usual, the chat is closed to participants, and we'll just be using it to share some links out. Um, but if you have any questions, please do use the Zoom questions and answers features, and uh, we'll either answer your question out loud when we get to the Q&A portion um, or in writing in that feature. So to download today's slides, as well as resource guide that contains links, contact information, and the content for today, um, you can go to the California Outreach webpage on Linktree at linktr dot ee slash Cal Outreach. Um, you can find today's coffee session under the current month and download the resource guide and PowerPoint file. Um, and that will be popped into the chat as well. So for today's agenda, if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll cover training opportunities as usual. We have a quick website poll to start us off, um, and then we'll get into some score reporting updates, talk a bit about secure file sharing. We'll talk about some changes, some blueprint changes to the California Spanish Assessment or CSA. Um, get into our standard stairs trips, a stairs tips, and then our call drivers, uh, ending with reminders as usual, and then we'll get into the Q&A portion. So we've got lots to cover and we will get started. So for training opportunities, we've got uh, some upcoming trainings. We have the new coordinator uh, training webinar, which is part of a series for new coordinators. Um, this is number seven and uh, the topic is preparing for testing. So that's going to be held on November 21st, 2024 from 3 to 4 p.m. And then we also have the pretest virtual training series this month, or I'm um, sorry, in December. Uh, we have what's new for the LPAC on December 3rd, and then we have what's new for CASP on December 11th. And you can see the dates and sign up links um, in your resource guide. We also have some recordings that have been posted. So we have the new coordinator training webinar number six. Uh, that one was on the topic of, topic of student practice. Um, and then we have the Supporting Students with Interim Assessments Shared Practices webinar series that has been posted, as well as the Introduction to the California Educator Reporting System, or SERS for teachers, and the Introduction to SERS for test coordinators and administrators. So those are some really awesome uh, trainings. You can access them on the upcoming and on-demand trainings page. Um, we have some opportunities to get involved. Um, we actually included a get involved flyer in the resource guide. So this is a, 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 a flyer that you could pass on to your LEA staff to encourage them to sign up for these opportunities. Um, so some of the opportunities um, coming up are that we do need Spanish teachers um, for the spring CSA achievement level descriptors review meeting and the summer CSA standard setting. Um, you can take a look with this QR code here. There's also a link in your resource guide to the Get Involved page. Um, and then we also have some deadlines. Um, if we go to the next slide here, uh, tomorrow is the deadline to sign up for the California Science Test or CAST item review meeting uh, for grade eight, and that's the application deadline. And then November 22nd is the deadline uh, for the application for the LPAC range finding meeting. So. You can check those out again at the Get Involved website at this QR, QR code here. And next, we're going to start us off with a website poll. So for this, I will pass it on to Christine um, to chat about this. Hey, thanks, Cyan. Um, I wanted to get an idea of how many of you are using our homepage on the new website that includes the announcements and tips and key dates and events section. Um, so we're going to do a quick poll. Tyler, I was hoping you would show the area that I'm talking about. So we did have these sections on the old websites, but they were not often updated. And now and there's a lot more information that's being included here. So I wanted to get an idea of how often you all are using these sections. And I also wanted to take the opportunity to advertise this for you to let you know that this is updated much more often now to give you relevant and timely information. So please go ahead and complete the poll and let us know how often you're using them. Um, and if we see folks aren't using them, we'll try to get um, more messaging out to remind folks that there is relevant information information here. Awesome. We're getting a lot of participation right now. So we'll just hang tight uh, until we get, it starts to taper out. 
it looks like a relatively even split so far um, with about a quarter of folks who are referring to it often. We'll just hang tight. Okay, I think we're good. Yeah. For my for my never group that never wasn't aware of it, um, hopefully you'll be using that now that you are aware of it and you'll find that information useful. We'll continue to add to it or things that come up that are timely and relevant for you. Um, one thing I will note under the events section that for major workshop or training series that have multiple dates, we don't always post them as a single event. If it's a one-time event, like our coffee sessions, scoring reporting webinar, um, some different things like that, we will post them in the event section. But if it's for a whole series that has a ton of different events, like for example, your interim informative assessment training series, um, there's a bunch of different dates. We will announce registration under the news and tips, but we won't post each of those separate events. And you can always look under the upcoming and on-demand training opportunities to see what things are coming up as well. And then for um, for my middle group there that's aware but don't refer to them often, hopefully this helps you um, know that there is information constantly being added and you will start referring to them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. All right, up next, uh, we have some score reporting updates. So pending the California State Board of Education or SBE approval at the November SBE meeting, which is happening tomorrow, November 13th, um, the achievement level descriptors and labels for the Smarter Balanced Assessments for uh, English Language Arts or ELA uh, and Mathematics and CAST will be updated starting in 2024-25. Um, so with this change, the scale score ranges and achievement level cut scores will not change, um, but the descriptors and labels for them will. Um, the California, or sorry, the CDE is also recommending that student score reports um, are revised in order to address these updates, um, as well as a couple other minor technical revisions. And so these changes um, are being recommended to align with the uh, flyer that we shared out actually in our last coffee session. So this is a Smarter Balanced Assessments, What Do the Scores Mean flyer? Um, and that's linked in your resource guide if you want to check that out. Um, we also have one other uh, score reporting update. This is um, pretty quick here, but the independent student reports or the ISRs in SIRS are now available for CAST and LPAC interim assessments. Um, and just one note about this is that uh, if you're looking at the ISRs for ELA and math assessments, you may notice that they have a slightly different look from previous years. Um, there were some minor updates to the look and feel so that they could feel more similar um, and more consistent with the uh, look and feel of the CAST and LPAC ISRs as well. So you may notice that. All right. And in our next section, I'm going to pass it on to Sylvia to uh, chat about the secure file sharing. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so secure file center sharing. So this is actually a new, not new, but it's been in the system, but something that we want to just bring forth and just kind of highlight is a, a very cool tool that could be useful for many of us. Um, we have, as of recently, started using it internally here within ETS, and so we'd like to share it out to you. Um, so for short, it is referenced as SFF. SFC, excuse me, that's a tongue twister, also known as the Secure File Center. The location of this tool slash resource is going to be in the completion status system. I do want to highlight that for you guys. The completion status system um, can be accessed either through the links tab within your Tom's account or from our website, cast-lpac.org. Um, you're going to access it from the system links towards the top right corner of the page. And so again, that's called the completion status system. This includes the secure file center, which is created when the results include 21 or more school sites. Um, the SFC can be accessed by selecting the secure file center, and it's typically located in the near the right top corner, as you can see below in our screenshot. And in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go over some of the benefits and the features of um, utilizing this resource. So what it does is it streamlines the process of storing, sharing, and managing large quantities of files. Um, it, this makes it for being efficient for you. It does include the following features. So number one would be the file storage. The file storage um, 
is temporary. You can use it for temporary or archived areas. It does have an expiration time. So for exported files, this is inclusive of 30 days, whereas for shared files, it's gonna include 15 days. For file sharing, this allows users um, to share files by role or by email address with notifications sent to the recipients. Um, let's see, batch actions. This allows users to manage multiple files at once by labeling, archiving, deleting, and downloading them. So it just helps make it more um, organized and efficient for you. And then some of the additional features would be file management. This allows users to view, download, label, archive, or delete files. Um, note that the archive files are stored separate for long-term access. We have access control, which allows only users with appropriate TOMS credentials to access shared files, ensuring security. And then last but not least, expiration management. This enables automatic expiration of files, ensuring the repository remains current and files are cleared after a set period. And so that goes back to those expiration dates, um, either 30 days or 15 days. Um, if this is something that you would like a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with, you can reach out to us, ETS staff, and we can give you a little bit more training information. Um, again, this is available on the slides today. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. All right. Next, we have some blueprint changes to the CSA. Um, so as an overview for this, um, this September, September 2024, the SBE approved revisions to the test blueprint and addendum for the high level test design of the CSA. Um, and this removed the speaking domain from the assessments for grades three through eight. Um, so that will begin with the 2024-25 test administration. Um, the speaking domain is going to remain for the high school grade band, um, and that's intended to meet in part the requirements for the state seal of biliteracy. Um, however, the full write and constructed response items are going to remain for all grade levels and grade bands. So that's three through eight and the high school grade band. Um, so with this change, um, this upcoming change is also based on LEA feedback. Um, we got some feedback and to reduce, reduce the burden on LEAs and test administrators, um, the speaking items for the high school grade band and the writing uh, constructed response items for all grade levels are going to be scored by ETS, the, the testing vendor. Um, so there will be no local scoring by the LEA for the CSA. Um, and because of that, there will be no required scoring training for LEAs as well. So. Um, that is a change coming up and it will be applicable to 2024-25. Um, this year, the CSA administration window uh, will open on Tuesday, March 4th, 2025. Um, that is a change for this year um, and it's expected to revert back to the typical administration window um, in future years. Um, and let's see here. Oh, yes. And then the September 11th board item um, document is available in your resource guide if you want to get some more information on the changes to the CSA. All right. Um, next, we have stair tips. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Vincent. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Hadamil. I'm here to give stairs tips as per usual during our, our coffee sessions. Um, so I have two topics for you guys. And um, we're going to go over them really quickly. Um, the first one is a little bit <clears throat> is a little bit bigger. So these are involving grade level changes in kindergarten through grade two. Um, in the event you have a student who is partially tested or has completed testing uh, for the initial LPAC for kinder uh, for kindergarten through grade two, it's important to note that when a grade change happens, a reset must be requested for all the domains taken. Each grade level change from students in kindergarten through grade two is a required retest of the assessment. I'd like to follow up with this by making sure that we're, you know, always checking our demographic information and that it's accurate and up to date at least two days prior to testing. If a change needs to be made, ensure that the test examiner is informed of the change and there's enough time for TOMS and the test delivery system to pick up those changes prior to the student logging on to the test. <clears throat> prior to the student logging on to the test for the first time. If the initial LPAC or the initial alternate LPAC is completed with incorrect demographic information, a stairs case will be required to reset a domain or all domains to make that change. 
Secondly, we want to talk about stairs cases and withdrawing or leaving a note requesting us not to process them. Um, basically, this came about from a submission that was made. There was a request to do an SSID swap, and within that request in the notes uh, section, the submitter requested that we not process that case. Uh, in most cases, we will catch these things. As um, when you post a note to us, we are notified and we'll look at it and say, okay, you know, make sure that we don't process for you, this for you. But in a case where you made the note as part of your submission, asking us not to, uh, there is a chance that we that it will end up getting processed. So it's much better if you do not want your case to be processed to use the withdrawal feature. Um, if you withdraw the case, we are not able to process it and it is removed from the system. Okay, I think that's everything for me this time. Great. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. Diane, there's a question in the chat for Vincent. Um, can you repeat the stairs type to use on the grade level change, the reset? What was the narrative? Thank you. Sure. So for grade level changes, uh, we're going to want to use administered incorrect assessment for the domains of speaking, listening, and reading. And for writing in K through two, we have to use data entry issue. All right. Thank you, Vincent. Um, up next, we're actually gonna have Sylvia jump back on again to cover our call drivers. Hello again. So we've just got one call driver for today. Um, again, these are things that we're seeing more consistently when we receive inquiries. And so the cars, for long is known as the crisis alert response system. So what happens here is upon discovery that a response requires attention, and typically what that means is that when the student was inputting a response, there may have been some words, some language that triggered a CARS to be created. And so what happens is the Tom system will notify you, um, that being the LEA CASP coordinator or the LEA coordinators, if there are secondaries, you will all be contacted. This is also inclusive of the superintendent. What Tom's does is they'll notify you via email. Um, something to know about these emails is that the moment that it's created, it does notify you within a three hour time, time frame. And then if um, no attention is given to it, you will continue to receive um, repeated Tom's notification emails. Really important about these notifications a recipient of the CARS email is required to acknowledge the CARS incident by logging into your TOMS account and accessing that CARS page. Um, specifically for those of you that may be both an LEA CAS and LPAC coordinator, you want to pay attention to the program for which the CARS was triggered. If it was for CAS, you want to make sure you log in under your CAS role and vice versa for LPAC. Um, you will notice too when you're acknowledging these CARS incidents that there's going to be an acknowledge button. There's also going to be an acknowledge an archive. That archive is available to you um, only at the point where locally you have reviewed it, you've gone through what your process is, and you're ready to now archive it. So at the minimum, we do ask that you acknowledge it, do your part by um, doing your local process, and then you're going to go back in when you're ready to go ahead and archive. Um, another very important tip about these CARS notifications, unfortunately, you are not able to forward them over to others um, that are not LEA coordinators or the superintendent to review within TOMS. That's due to a restriction. This is a system permission, and so it's only accessible to LEA CASP and LPAC coordinators as well as superintendents. Thank you, guys. Sylvia, I just wanted to add here that the emails that go out, um, the reminders don't, if, if discovered on a weekend, the reminders don't start until that following Monday. So you won't get reminders starting on a weekend. That's correct. Thank you, Christine. Great. Thank you both. All right. We've got just a few reminders to get through and then we will move into our Q&A portion. So to start some CASP and LPAC reminders, um, first reminder is to set up your CASP test administration window by December 1st, 2024, if you have not yet. Um, that's an ongoing reminder. Um, and you know our next copy session will be after that deadline. So please do keep that in mind. Um, 
Also around this time, please communicate with your special education staff and other staff as needed to review uh, individualized education programs or IEPs uh, and Section 504 plans before the administration of the CAP, uh, CASP and LPAC summative assessments. Um, additionally, we just want to point you guys again to the 2024-25 coordinator checklist. They're linked in your resource guide. There's a page on the CASP and LPAC website. Um, this will, you know, will help you in preparation for your assessment administration. So definitely do check those out. They're a really great resource. Um, up next, we have some uh, reminders regarding the uh, LPAC administration and scoring trainings or ASTs. So the summative LPAC AST and the summative alternate LPAC AST are both now available in Moodle. Um, access codes were emailed to uh, LEA coordinators. Uh, if you can't find your access code, you can contact this email here, Moodle support at SCOE.net, um, and they'll get you that access code. Um, the deadline to complete the LEA certification courses in Moodle is December 6th, 2024. So the summative LPAC AST is required for all LEAs, and the summative alternate LPAC uh, AST is required for LEAs that have eligible students. Um, test, in, test examiners must complete calibration and certification before uh, they administer either of these assessments. And finally, we just have a list here of some updated resources, all of which are available in your resource guide. We have updated the CASP and LPAC uh, Technical Specifications and Configurations Guide, as well as the CASP and LPAC Accessibility Guide. We've got the Accessibility Graphics uh, webpage up. Um, those have been posted. And then we also have this CASP Student Needs Matching Tool web document. That's a really cool tool um, that's available. Go ahead and check that out. That is also linked in your resource guide. But we just wanted to call these out so that you are aware of updated and new resources that are available to you. And with that, I think we can move on to our questions and answers. I'm seeing in the Q&A feature that a lot of folks have marked that they want to answer. I will start with you, Christine, okay. actually. <laughs> um, I just wanted to clarify about the CARS alerts. If if it is identified, you'll get the email once on a weekend, but you won't keep getting those reminders over the weekends. The reminders will, will kick in on the Monday after it's discovered, if it's discovered on a weekend. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then there was a question about how do the LEA coordinators communicate the CARS notices to the principals? Um, there are a couple different ways you could do it. Different people do it differently. Um, some notify by phone. Um, others may put it into um, a secure, you know, a file and send it to them that way. Um, so it's really up to you. But it does contain, you know, secure information. And so that's why the email um, is unable to be forwarded as is. And then I see that there's a few questions around the achievement level descriptors and those changing. So I, Devin, I saw that you flagged a question to answer about um, if levels three and four are considered at or above standard. So for everybody that's watching this, um, that has been trying to stay up to date on the achievement level descriptors changing, um, I wanna post a link for you in the chat here. This is CDE's um, November board item agenda, and it's item five. Um, that's the agenda. So I'll post that for you. It's item five. And in item five, you'll not only see a proposed sample of the student score report, how that would be changed. Um, they also have in there in the item itself, they have some additional descriptions on how those levels will change. Um, and then just to let folks know that for, um, for this upcoming school year, the video student score reports will also be updated with new language around the revised achievement level descriptors. So Devin, I don't know if you wanted to explain more about levels three and four and what's considered standard or not standard. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, yeah, I'll just I'll just speak to that question uh, real, real briefly. Um, we have received a few questions um, asking, hey, we noticed the ALDs are changing. How should I be messaging about this? And so, um, you know, of course, you know, how each LEA messages about 
uh, results to interest holders, to families, et cetera, is, is ultimately a local decision. Um, because, because in that, you know, it involves, um, you know, the, the, the audience that, that you are speaking to and, um, you know, understanding that audience and uh, catering your message as such. However, I will mention a few things, um, you know, that, that what do the scores mean document is, is intended to, to help and support with messaging. It's not a mandatory resource that you have to use, but it is a good resource. And then in terms of level three and four, um, and in regards to the, uh, the idea of at or above standard or, or below standard, uh, one of the um, uh, motivations behind making this change was that it was noticed that the terms at or above standard were often being misunderstood at at or above or below grade level. And um, this is not necessarily true because each test is a grade level test. So for example, you can't use a grade five ELA assessment to say that a student is at a fourth grade or a sixth grade level. Um, and if a student takes the grade five ELA assessment and scores a level two, they actually got uh, some grade level questions correct. So, um, so, so the revision to the ALDs is in part a response to this and to help clarify that just because a student scored a level one or two does not mean that they are below grade level and and the use of standard was seen as being creating this misunderstanding so 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 that might help in um in in determining how you message to different interest holders um and then ultimately yes all, all the comprehensive information is going to be in that november item and provided that the SBE approves it, uh, the CDE will then look towards revising uh, the public reporting website and, and other resources to align. Thank you. And I did see another question about um, will we, we will we be revising the data that's reported on the student score report? So at this time, there's no further changes in in reporting additional data or elements. It's just the achievement level descriptors that are changing and how those will be represented on the student score report. Yeah, thank you, Christina. I, I forgot to mention too. It's and it's important to note that the criteria for the levels has not changed at all. So none of the cut scores have changed. Um, uh, what it took to get a level two before is same for a level two now and for all the other levels. So um, the only revisions are to the words and the language uh, itself. And then there was, a, I'm switching topics here, but there was somebody that asked a question through the um, question on the Padlet about um, domain exemptions and the SACE auto update uh, with test settings. And so basically what the person was told is that, um, that domain exemptions will not automatically update from SACE. Um, and so that is correct. We are not taking domain exemptions um, automatically through SACE. That is something you will still have to go into to Tom's to do if you are exempting students from specific domains. Um, and then I know that SACE is still working out some details. This particular person said that they're they're mostly part of the way there to, to getting their, um, their test settings to automatically upload. So hopefully some of you are also having success with that and are working with SACE to get those things functioning. Great, thank you, Christine. Was there any other questions on your end? I'm going through here and just making sure. Um, there was one more. So a person asked if they have to unassign um, any new coming English learners from the ELA test. Um, so the answer to that is no, you don't, there is no, there is no exemption or anything from the ELA test that you input to have it not be available. The test will still be available for the student regardless. Um, you just won't give it to them and then it'll automatically calculate that they've been in a U.S. school for less than 12 months. And Devin, remind me, I don't believe it does affect their completion percentage if the student has been in the U.S. less than 12 months, correct? You are correct. So those those newcomer EL students, they they can take the test. It is it is optional, um, and if they choose not to take the test, uh, the account of uh, the dashboard office when they're generating the calculations for the dashboard will look directly at the CalPads information, and they will remove those students from your ELA 
participation rate, uh, please keep in mind that they do still count towards your mathematics participation rate. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Tyler. So you have a few marked here to respond to. Yes, I do. Thanks, Cyan. Um, so the first question was uh, in tools for teachers, are there any science uh, interim items released? I only see ELA and math. Um, so uh, for tools for teachers, a lot of the resources on there, a lot of the lesson plans are shaped around ELA and math, but there are some science options um, where you might be looking. Um, if you are logged in with using your single sign on your Tom's credentials, uh, then you'll see science added. So it might be that you're looking at it without logging in, which only shows you some of the things available. Um, you should also be able to like search by subject, um, but there definitely are some science uh, related. Um, oh, I'm actually getting over 90 science resources. This is way more than I thought. So I know they're adding those all the time. There's even some that are focused on um, English learners as well um uh that that are i think there's a like three lpac related um resources on there and more getting adding added also so make sure you're logged in to to find all of those uh the other question i had was let's find it here um uh, remind me where to find rubrics for interim assessment performance tasks. Um, so the best place to go um, is in Tom's actually. So every uh, every interim assessment has has some secure materials in Tom's. If you go to the resources tab, um, there's a different kind of page for, there's one for Smarter Balanced um, ELA and Math, there's one for CAST and one page for LPAC interim um, uh, materials for the smarter balanced ELA and math uh, interim assessments. You can also go to the smarter balanced content explorer um, that also has uh, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, rubrics in it. It's even more dynamic, but uh, in those, the PDFs that are in Tom's also have all of those rubrics. Uh, let's see. And the last question I had. Uh, was, have any of the quick reference guides been updated with the new website features, such as how to start a test session, how to log into the DEI? Um, there's several quick start guides or, or quick reference guides that are being updated now. Um, some of it, some on our website you might find still have go to casp.org um, or lpac.org instead of the new casp-lpac.org. Um, so they're not going to change a ton for most of those, but they are being updated. But also just keep in mind that um, pretty much all of those directions still hold up. And if you go to casp.org um, or someone, you know, clicks on casp.org or lpac.org, it'll forward you to our new site. It'll redirect you. So, um, but yes, those are um, in the process of being updated soon, at least most of them, I think. So I think that's all I had. Great, thank you, Tyler. Okay. Um, I see a question here. I don't know if Sylvia or Jeff will be able to answer, or whoever whoever will be able to. Um, but someone is asking about what is the best way to communicate with sites about CARS cases? How much information can we share? I, I can know, take that one, Cyan. Um, one of the things that folks can do that might find it easily is that um, if they copy and paste just the written section of what the issue is from the CARS alert, you can paste that into another email with only the SSID. Um, that way it doesn't have additional information about the student and then you can email it that way. Um, so that might be the easiest way for you to do it. Um, like I said, other people are doing it differently in terms of you know turning it into a secure document and providing a password. Um, so that's really up to you, but that might be an easy option for you. And then, Cyan, I did want to clarify, um, someone said that they thought that they received an email saying the test settings are not um, not going to be automated for this year. And I just want to clarify. So um, at one point, so we're still working through with SACE on exactly how to get that functioning and functioning properly for the districts. Um, so districts are supposed to be working directly with the SACE team to get that feature working for their particular LEA. Um, but knowing that that wasn't functioning, one of the things that we were considering doing was just rolling over your test settings from last year and not purging those from the test operations management system. So that's what that email refers to. That email explains 
against you that we did not roll over your test settings in the test operations management system from last year, those were purged. So that is separate from the automating through SACE. Um, so again, work directly with SACE to get your district um, or your LEA set up for the transfer of automated test settings. I know that they're still working through some challenges and there's some you know individual things going on with the different LEAs. Um, so I just wanted to clarify the difference between what that email was about versus the automated test settings for um, with SACE. Great. Thanks for the clarification, Christine. Um, Devin, uh, I see that you have a question you'd like to answer. All right. I'll just jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, common question uh, regarding test completion rates and TOMS versus participation rates. And just a reminder that test completion uh, is different than test participation. We tend to use participation when referring to the rates on the California school uh, dashboard, and those are accountability participation rates. Now, the dashboard office is going to apply some exclusions uh, when they generate their participation rates. So the completion rates in TOMS will be slightly different because those students are not pre-excluded. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a newcomer e EL student can take the test. So we're not gonna automatically remove that student from your completion rates. And, and, um, and so that's why, that's one of the reasons uh, why those two reports will, will be different. Thank you, Devin. Um, let me see if there was any that folks marked. Um, somebody is asking again about cars and they're asking how writing is determined. So last year's written prompt triggered a lot of cars cases for their LEA. And they're wondering if, you know, things like that, um, maybe some items that are likely to trigger, um, a cars case are taken into consideration when they're determining writing prompts. Don't know if, if you have an answer. I'm not sure if I can answer that specifically. I, I just know that there are um, there's certain things within the algorithm that uh, that it's set up to search for certain terms. Um, you know, of course, anything indicating they might harm themselves or another student, things like that, um, will definitely be flagged. Um, however, there are some things that happen that inadvertently, you know, flag something that that isn't necessarily a, an alert. Like, for example, if a student is um, referencing song lyrics that talk about something like that, um, that inadvertently um, gets a flag, there are things that can happen like that. Um, so it's not perfect, but it is intended to, you know, get students the quickest support possible. So please definitely review those and hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Christine, I'm actually going to jump in about the song lyrics because those questions have come to us as to why they're being flagged. And we've had conversations with the section that does the deciding of the flagging and everything. And I think the best answer I was ever given, and it was totally unexpected, is what if this child is using a song lyric in order to call for help? So there is the, that reasoning that the song lyrics are included as well. And Bob, since we have you, this, um, I don't think we have any plans, but a person has asked, is there any way to have the prompt added, prompt added to the CARS alert? There is, there is not, because that is a uh, actual live question within the assessment. So we don't give that information out. Um, it's, the, the, it's better to err on the side of caution with a student than um, to just let something go. But because they are live test questions and they're not being removed from the assessment and questions are used, you know, multiple states in that, uh, we, we can't give that information out. Thank you. Um, a question here is, someone is wondering how many LEAs are utilizing the automatic updates from SACE to TOMS. Um, do we have any numbers behind that? I'm going to let Bob answer that one because he has better information than I do. Well, actually, um, I don't think I do on this one, Christine. We, <laughs> we do know that there are a number of LEAs who have turned it on within SACE. Um, I will say that uh, at the start, there were some bumps in the road as SACE was sending us coding that we had to get corrected. 
uh, one of the LAAs who has been working very closely with us. Oh, uh, Brady just said San Francisco USD is, and he put an exclamation, so I'm going to assume he's happy. Um, otherwise, Brady probably would be saying something else. Um, but when we first started doing this, we had one LA that was working really closely with us and with SACE, letting us know the errors that they were getting. And we just got an email from them today that said they had zero error errors coming back from their SACE updates. So um, that's that's wonderful news. Now, uh, we do um, want to continue working with SACE as well as other SIS vendors. We actually reached out to all of the SIS vendors today to find out exactly where everybody is, and we will be creating information for our website to let all LEAs know who's on board, how to get yourself on board, and uh, what method within the SIS or the SACE or um, Eros, I believe is the other one, uh, program to get yourself started. Great, thank you. I see we have some folks working in the background typing away. So I'll take a look at these other questions that are open. Looks like we just have some feedback. Someone is asking about, you know, allowing site coordinators to upload in bulk test assignments. So remote test settings, cast assignments, et cetera. I don't know if there's any commentary anyone wants to uh, respond to on that feedback there. I don't have anything to say about that, Cyan, other than we can, you know, certainly take that back to the team. But I did want to um, put a plug in for our webinar that we are doing um, next Friday. So it's a CalPads and assessment webinar. This is the first of its type that we are that we are doing. So basically, the CDE and the assessment and um, assessment division and the CalPads division, as well as ETS, are all coming together to help explain to not only coordinators but also um, to the CalPads coordinators exactly you know how the systems impact each other and the things that you should keep an eye out for to ensure that you have a successful testing season and with hopefully minimal um, amount of stairs cases. Um, Vincent will thank you for that because he is the one that uh, processes all those stairs cases. So I'm going to post the um, registration link in the chat for that webinar. Um, if you wait, have... Tyler already oh, Tyler already did it for me. Thank you, Tyler. So if you haven't already registered for that, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, this will be a unique opportunity um, for all of you to attend and hear from uh, both sides. Perfect. Thank you so much for plugging that, Christine. Um, I actually think we're down to just one open question, and we're waiting to get a little bit more information on that person's question here. Um, so we maybe we can hang tight just for like 30 seconds here and see if we get more questions. Well, in. actually, I'm going to steal the spotlight for a second. Yeah, for Christine already mentioned this, but um, I was at CERA this past week and talking with LEAs, and there, there's a lot of excitement about this. So I do want to bring up, I know Christine mentioned the video score reports. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at any of the emails that have gone out, and we're going to send out a, an updated one uh, probably later this week or next week, um, you know, we're talking about those new uh, descriptors for achievement levels and such. And some of the things that are going to be added to the video score reports for this year are histor historical data for both EL, uh, LPAC and for CASP. So if a child has tested in either in the last two years, their scores will be there. We will also be adding um, two verbal languages, spoken languages. So it'll be English, Spanish, and we're working on uh, numbers right now to see which two other languages are going to become the next two. And then we're gonna add five closed caption languages as well. So if, if a language doesn't quite get the number so that we're gonna do the spoken version, they will have them in closed caption. More resources are available. It's gonna be done through TOMS this year, which means uh, that we're also working with your SIS vendors to slide the video links right into your parent portal. And that would happen right about the same time that the SSRs are released. So you could use those along with the analytics dashboard. And then with the achievement descriptors, uh, the new achievement level descriptors, uh, Christine and the team from Idaho who works with us have been working very hard already on putting those new descriptors into layman terms for parents to understand what the new descriptors mean. And unlike uh, in the past where we just said, hey, your student scored a two, three, four, whatever, and that's what this means, parents are going to be offered the chance to 
click on any one of the achievement levels to get a good description as to what each level means. So if their child is a two, they can click on the three to hear what is it that would make my child a three or a four and such. So um, if you're interested in those, watch for your emails. We're gonna put out quote request forms and everything else like that. Uh, we will say they went up to $1.50 this year. Uh, so it's an extra 50 cents, but well, well worth it. And now through my talking, you got a bunch of questions. <laughs> yes, thanks, Bob. Actually, though, we do have a question about the video SSRs. Could you just clarify? I know you, you mentioned it's uh, two dollar fifty now. Could you just briefly go over the um, pay or sorry, the cost for the video SSRs? Yeah, so um, it's one dollar fifty cents per student per assessment. So for any kid or uh, any student who is taking the CASP that you want to have the videos for, it's one dollar fifty cents. And then for your LPAC for every child that you want the videos for, it's one dollar fifty cents for those. And I actually had somebody I was speaking to today said, wait, that costs less money than it costs for me to send out the uh, mailers. And I went, well, that's something to think about. Thanks, Bob. And Devin, I see you have a question here you wanted to answer. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Um, regarding uh, participation rates uh, once more and uh, the reports within TOMS, um, the question is, we used to be able to get the school participation rates as percentages in TOMS, cannot this year. Um, I, I, the, the dashboard office is, is going to take all of the final, um, data from, from the year. And, and again, they're going to apply some of those exclusions, um, and, um, accountability testing window rules. And, th and that's how they're going to generate the participation rates. And they do all that after the state testing window has concluded. So, th so there really is no way to get, um, a dashboard participation rate from the CDE prior to the close of the window. So to my knowledge, I don't, I don't think this has ever been in TOMS. Um, there, there is a completion status summary report in TOMS that, that will provide a completion percentage. But again, completion is different than um, participation. And Cyan, I saw that there was a couple of questions about CSA and how that's changed and who's scoring. Um, I know we have an email that will be going out to coordinators about CSA that hasn't gone out yet. Uh, yes, we haven't. Yes, we do. We have an email that's going out. I believe it will be going out Wednesday or Thursday this week. OK, so you'll be getting an email this week. But just a couple things about CSA. Um, one of the questions was, will they have to local score in the future? Um, so no, there will be no local scoring. So w what happened is based on you know feedback from um, from LEAs, they took the um, the speaking test, removed it for grades three through eight because it was making the test much longer. And there were some concerns. And so the the California Department of Education really wanted to make the test um, as useful as possible for all of you, particularly since it's an optional assessment. Um, we, we'd really like folks to be using that and using that um, for um, the seal of biliteracy and, and all the good things that come out of that. So no local scoring now and not in the future. Um, the testing time that was um, with this with the speaking portion in three through eights will go back to similar what it was before. So I hope that encourages many of you to administer the CSA if you were on the ropes about that. So more information coming this week in an email to all of you. Christina, this is Tracy. I just wanna clarify that it will not be going back to two hours. Um, we have to be very careful. The writing um, is going to take um, a lot longer, but it will not be the four, three and a half to four and a half hours for grades three through eight. So, um, but I just, uh, we're still determining all of that information from our field desk that just completed. Um, and that information will be shared as soon as possible. Um, and that information will be included in our um, preparing for administration documents which um, we hope to have coming out as well uh, within the coming weeks. So more Thank you, Tracy, for follow. that clarification. Thanks. And then, then with that, um, they're happy about the not scoring for CSA. Someone asks, are there plans for ETS to score the LPAC speaking domain someday in the future? And um, I can just say not at this time. No, um, that that would have to be a part of a contract discussion, and uh, the cost is prohibitive to be scoring um, 
one million students speaking um, test. Um, so um, compared to what do we have? Six thousand high school um, tests. So it, it's a it's a huge difference, and the cost savings um, on the three through eight uh, for removing all the speaking and feature through this uh, development is making um, way for paying for the cost for doing the scoring on the high school. So um, it wasn't that we came up with more money. It was just that, you know, we, uh, through the blueprint change, we've now been able to come up and uh, support the scoring um, of the high school test, uh, which is what is needed for the state seal of biliteracy. So that was um, our goal is to ensure that um, the test was still going to be able to meet in part the state seal of biliteracy, especially at the high school level. Um, and then um, to take some of that burden off of our, as uh, Christine said, there are test administrators and our LEAs. Great, thank you, Christine. Judy, I see you're answering a question about the matrix. Um, and I just wondered if you wanted to um, answer that live. The question is, has the matrix been updated to show that the calculator tool is now only a universal tool, not designated uh, or accommodation unless it is non-embedded? So I, I know that it's recently been updated, but I don't know if that specific update was um, made. No, so uh, it's saying that the calculator tool uh, that's embedded is, is a universal tool for calculator allowed questions is the segment on the test. So when the calculator is allowed uh, for the grade 6, 8 to 11, um, there will be a calculator that students can access. Um, when we talk about non-embedded, that's because they can only use a non-embedded calculator on a, non on a calculator allowed segment. So um, yeah, I was going to type it for more clarity. <laughs> but um, so once it, but the, the test allows you to use the calculator, it allows the student to use the calculator. All students can use the calculator, the non the embedded one. If they need to have an um, IEP or 504 to be able to use a non embedded calculator on the calculator allow segment of the test. And then it looks like there's one outstanding question up there, which is actually not a question. It is um, one of our coordinators helpfully sharing information with the rest of you. So it looks like there is a video up on YouTube about the SACE to Tom's upload process that um, potentially came from maybe the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools. And so it looks like that's a resource that folks are finding useful. So we will, um, so be sure to grab that. I'll, I'll post the link to it in the chat as well. And then Tyler, if we could post a link to the video along with the SACE handout in Padlet um, for folks, uh, that would be great too. Thanks, Christine. Um, with that, we don't have any other questions to answer. So perhaps we can wrap up a little bit early today. Um, just want to say thank you everyone for your time. If you have any questions that come up, um, always feel free to reach out to your success agent. You can also reach out to us at caloutreach at ets.org. Um, and yeah, uh, someone's asking if we can post the link to the Padlet. I think we can get that posted in the chat. It's at also at uh, accessible at linktree slash caloutreach. So L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash caloutreach. Um, and you'll also be able to find it in the uh, coffee session slides. And um, Cyan, I did I did just put the direct link to the to our coffee session Padlet page. Um, I actually added a column that's specific to this the test settings API um, info. So I'm gonna there's that handout that SACE made is posted on there. I'm gonna put this YouTube video um, that someone posted as well on there. But I also just made a card. Um, that like if you want to share your contact info, if you've like worked through some of this and want uh, are okay with other folks reaching out to you to, to ask questions, like that's a place you can go. Um, but uh, I I did want to say you know we're gonna try to work on um, creating a, a page with some some info, but we're still just gathering information and still still working on that as far as like information on our sites or in our manuals. So keep an eye out. But um, for now, yeah, we can direct some folks here. Great, thank you. And we do actually have one question that came through. Um, someone is asking, 
will students need a headphone with a headphones with a microphone for the CSA? And I don't remember whether or not that was a requirement or a recommendation. I don't know if Tracy, if you want to jump in and confirm. Um, those are a uh, recommendation, um, but every uh, district should make sure that they, um, if they do not have headsets with microphones, that they at minimum make sure they are testing uh, the volume and recording uh, in a training test or something like that, just to make sure that they can clearly hear the responses that are being recorded um, as the students speak. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tracy. All right, with that, I think we're ready to close out. Thank you everyone for your time and have a great rest of your day. See ya. Yeah.